Chapter 18 The Grip of the Scorpion While from a proud tower in the town Death looks gigantically down Poe Hansen snored on the bed as I paced the room. Another day had passed over London, and again the street lamps glimmered through the fog, their lights affecting me strangely. They seemed to beat solid waves of energy against my brain. They twisted the fog into strange, sinister shapes. Footlights of the stage that is the streets of London. How many grisly scenes had they lighted? I pressed my hands hard against my throbbing temples, striving to bring my thoughts back from the chaotic labyrinth where they wandered. Gordon I had not seen since dawn. Following the clue of Soho 48, he had gone forth to arrange a raid upon the place, and he thought it best that I should remain under cover. He anticipated an attempt upon my life, and again he feared that if I went searching among the dives I formerly frequented, it would arouse suspicion. Hansen snored on. I seated myself and began to study the Turkish shoes which clothed my feet. Zuleika had worn Turkish slippers. How she floated through my waking dreams, gilding prosaic things with her witchery. Her face smiled at me from the fog. Her eyes shone from the flickering lamps. Her phantom footfalls re-echoed through the misty chambers of my skull. They beat an endless tattoo, luring and haunting, till it seemed that these echoes found echoes in the hallway outside the room where I stood, soft and stealthy. A sudden rap at the door and I started. Hansen slept on as I crossed the room and flung the door swiftly open. A swirling wisp of fog had invaded the corridor and through it, like a silver veil, I saw her. Zuleika stood before me with her shimmering hair and her red lips parted and her great dark eyes. Like a speechless fool I stood, and she glanced quickly down the hallway and then stepped inside and closed the door. Gordon, she whispered in a thrilling undertone, your friend, the scorpion, has him. Hansen had awakened and now sat gaping stupidly at the strange scene which met his eyes. Zuleika did not heed him. And oh, Stephen, she cried, and tears shone in her eyes. I have tried so hard to secure some more elixir, but I could not. Never mind that. I finally found my speech. Tell me about Gordon. He went back to Kamenos's alone, and Hasim and Ganra Singh took him captive and brought him to the master's house. Tonight, assemble a great host of the people of the Scorpion for the sacrifice. Sacrifice? A grisly thrill of horror coursed down my spine. Was there no limit to the ghastliness of this business? Quick, Zuleika, where is this house of the masters? Soho, 48. You must summon the police and send many men to surround it, but you must not go yourself. Hansen sprang up, quivering for action, but I turned to him. My brain was clear now, or seemed to be, and racing unnaturally. Wait, I turned back to Zuleika. When is this sacrifice to take place? At the rising of the moon. That is only a few hours before dawn. Time to save him, but if we raid the house, they'll kill him before he can reach them and God only knows how many diabolical things guard all approaches. I do not know, Zuleika whimpered. I must go now, or the master will kill me. Something gave way in my brain at that. Something like a flood of wild and terrible exultation swept over me. The master will kill no one, I shouted, flinging my arms on high. Before even the east turns red for dawn, the master dies. By all things holy and unholy, I swear it. Hansen stared wildly at me, and Zuleika shrank back as I turned on her. To my dope-inspired brain had come a sudden burst of light, true and unerring. I knew Cthulhu was a mesmerist, 
that he understood fully the secret of dominating another's mind and soul, and I knew that, at last, I had hit upon the reason of his power over the girl. Mesmerism. As a snake fascinates and draws to him a bird, so the master held Zuleika to him with unseen shackles. So absolute was his rule over her that it held even when she was out of his sight, working over great distances. There was but one thing which would break that hold, the magnetic power of some other person whose control was stronger with her than Cthulhu's. I laid my hands on her slim little shoulders and made her face me. Zuleika, I said commandingly, here you are safe. You shall not return to Cthulhu's. There is no need of it. Now you are free. But I knew I had failed even before I started. Her eyes held a look of amazed, unreasoning fear, and she twisted timidly in my grasp. Stephen, let me go, she begged. I must, I must. I drew her over to the bed and asked Hansen for his handcuffs. He handed them to me, wonderingly, and I fastened one cuff to the bedpost and the other to her slim wrist. The girl whimpered, but made no resistance, her limpid eyes seeking mine in mute appeal. It cut me to the quick to enforce my will upon her in this apparently brutal manner, but I steeled myself. Zuleika, I said tenderly, you are now my prisoner. The scorpion cannot blame you for not returning to him when you are unable to do so, and before the dawn you shall be free of his rule entirely. I turned to Hansen and spoke in a tone which admitted of no argument. Remain here, just without the door, until I return. On no account allow any strangers to enter, that is, anyone whom you do not personally know, and I charge you, on your honor as a man, do not release this girl, no matter what she may say. If neither I nor Gordon have returned by ten o'clock tomorrow, take her to this address. That family once was friends of mine, and will take care of a homeless girl. I am going to Scotland Yard. Stephen! Zuleika wailed. You are going to the master's lair. You will be killed. Send the police. Do not go. I bent, drew her into my arms, felt her lips against mine, then tore myself away. The fog plucked at me with ghostly fingers, cold as the hands of a dead man, as I raced down the street. I had no plan, but one was forming in my mind, beginning to seethe in the stimulated cauldron that was my brain. I halted at the sight of a policeman pacing his beat and beckoning him to me, scribbled a terse note on a piece of paper torn from a notebook and handed it to him. Get this to Scotland Yard. It's a matter of life and death, and it has to do with the business of John Gordon. At that name, a gloved hand came up in a swift ascent, but his assurance of haste died out behind me as I renewed my flight. The note stated briefly that Gordon was a prisoner at Soho 48 and advised an immediate raid in force. Advised, nay, in Gordon's name, commanded it. My reasons for my actions were simple. I knew that the first noise of the raid sealed John Gordon's doom. Somehow I must reach him and protect or free him before the police arrived. The time seemed endless, but at the last the grim, gaunt outlines of the house that was Soho 48 rose up before me, a giant ghost in the fog. The hour grew late. Few people dared the mists and the dampness as I came to a halt in the street before this forbidding building. No lights showed from the windows, either upstairs or down. It seemed deserted, but the lair of the scorpion often seems deserted until the silent death strikes suddenly. Here I halted, and a wild thought struck me. One way or another, the drama would be over by dawn. Tonight was the climax of my career, the ultimate top of life. Tonight I was the strongest link in the strange chain of events. Tomorrow it would not matter whether I lived or died. 
I drew the flask of elixir from my pocket and gazed at it. Enough for two more days, if properly eked out. Two more days of life. Or... I needed stimulation as I never needed it before. The task in front of me was one no mere human could hope to accomplish. If I drank the entire remainder of the elixir, I had no idea as to the duration of its effects, but it would last the night through. And my legs were shaky. My mind had curious periods of utter vacuity. Weakness of brain and body assailed me. For an instant I thought it was death. Never had I taken such an amount. Sky and world reeled, and I felt as if I would fly into a million vibrating fragments, like the bursting of a globe of brittle steel. Like fire, like hell fire, the elixir raced along my veins, and I was a giant, a monster, a superman. Turning, I strode to the menacing shadowy doorway. I had no plan, I felt the need of none. As a drunken man walks blithely into danger, I strode into the lair of the scorpion. Magnificently aware of my superiority, imperially confident of my stimulation, and sure as the unchanging stars that the way would open before me. Oh, there never was a superman like that who knocked commandingly on the door of Soho 48 that night in the rain and the fog. I knocked four times, the old signal that we slaves had used to be admitted into the idol room at Yan Chateau's. An aperture opened in the centre of the door, and slanted eyes looked warily out. They slightly widened as the owner recognised me, then narrowed wickedly. You fool, I said angrily. Don't you see the mark? I held up my hand to the aperture. Don't you recognise me? Let me in, curse you. I think the very boldness of the trick made for its success. Surely, by now, all the scorpion slaves knew of Stephen Costigan's rebellion, knew that he was marked for death, and the very fact that I came here inviting doom confused the doorman. The door opened and I entered. The man who had admitted me was a tall, lank Chinaman I had known as a servant of Cthulhu's. He closed the door behind me, and I saw we stood in a sort of vestibule, lighted by a dim lamp, whose glow could not be seen from the street, for the reason that the windows were heavily curtained. The Chinaman glowered at me undecided. I looked at him, tensed. Then suspicion flared in his eyes, and his hand flew to his sleeve. But at the instant I was on him, and his lean neck broke like a rotten bough between my hands. I eased his corpse to the thickly carpeted floor and listened. No sound broke the silence. Stepping as stealthily as a wolf, fingers spread like talons, I stole into the next room. This was furnished in oriental style, with couches and rugs and gold-worked drapery, but was empty of human life. I crossed it and went into the next one, Light flowed softly from the censers which were swung from the ceiling, and the eastern rugs deadened the sound of my footfalls. I seemed to be moving through a castle of enchantment. Every moment I expected a rush of silent assassins from the doorways, or from behind the curtains or screens, with their writhing dragons. Utter silence reigned. Room after room I explored, and at the last, halted at the foot of the stairs. The inevitable censer shed an uncertain light, but most of the stairs were veiled in shadows. What horrors awaited me above? But fear and the elixir are strangers, and I mounted that stair of lurking terror as boldly as I had entered that house of terror. The upper rooms I found to be much like those below, and with them they had this fact in common— they were empty of human life. I sought an attic, but there seemed no door letting into one. Returning to the first floor, I made a search for the entrance into the basement, but again my efforts were fruitless. The amazing truth was borne in upon me. Except for myself, 
and that dead man who was sprawled so grotesquely in the outer vestibule, there were no men in that house, dead or living. I could not understand it. Had the house been bare of furniture, I should have reached the natural conclusion that Cthulhu had fled, but no signs of flight met my eye. This was unnatural, uncanny. I stood in the great shadowy library and pondered. No, I had made no mistake in the house, even if the broken corpse in the vestibule were not there to furnish mute testimony, everything in the room pointed toward the presence of the master. There were the artificial palms, the lacquered screens, the tapestries, even the idol, though now no incense smoke rose before it. About the walls were ranged long shelves of books, bound in strange and costly fashion, books in every language in the world, I found from a swift examination, and on every subject, outre and bizarre, most of them. Remembering the secret passage in the Temple of Dreams, I investigated the heavy mahogany table which stood in the centre of the room. But nothing resulted. A sudden blaze of fury surged up in me, primitive and unreasoning. I snatched a statuette from the table and dashed it against the shelf-covered wall. The noise of its breaking would surely bring the gang from their hiding place, but the result was much more startling than that. The statuette struck the edge of the shelf, and instantly the whole section of shelves, with their load of books, swung silently outward, revealing a narrow doorway. As in the other secret door, a row of steps led downward. At another time I would have shuddered at the thought of descending, with the horrors of the other tunnel fresh in my mind but inflamed as I was by the elixir, I strode forward without an instant's hesitancy. Since there was no one in the house, they must be somewhere in the tunnel, or in whatever lair to which the tunnel led. I stepped through the doorway, leaving the door open. The police might find it that way and follow me, though somehow I felt as if mine would be a lone hand from start to grim finish. I went down a considerable distance, and then the stair debouched into a level corridor some twenty feet wide. A remarkable thing, in spite of the width, the ceiling was rather low, and from it hung small, curiously shaped lamps, which flung a dim light. I stalked hurriedly along the corridor, like old death seeking victims, and as I went I noted the work of the thing. The floor was of great broad flags, and the walls seemed to be of huge blocks of evenly set stone. This passage was clearly no work of modern days. The slaves of Cthulhu never tunneled there. Some secret way of medieval times, I thought. And after all, who knows what catacombs lie below London, whose secrets are greater and darker than those of Babylon and Rome. On and on I went and now I knew that I must be far below the earth. The air was dank and heavy, and cold moisture dripped from the stones of walls and ceilings. From time to time I saw smaller passages leading away in the darkness, but I determined to keep to the larger main one. A ferocious impatience gripped me. I seemed to have been walking for hours, and still only dank, damp walls and bare flags and guttering lamps met my eyes. I kept a close watch for sinister appearing chests or the like, saw no such things. Then, as I was about to burst into savage curses, another stare loomed up in the shadows in front of me. Chapter 19 Dark Fury The ringing wolf glared the circle round, through baleful blue-lit eye, not unforgetful of his debt, quoth he, I'll do some damage yet, or ere my turn to die. Mundy Like a lean wolf I glided up the stairs. Some twenty feet up there was a sort of landing from which other corridors diverged, much like the lower one by which I had come. 
the thought came to me that the earth below London must be honeycombed with secret passages, one above the other. Some feet above this landing, the steps halted at a door, and here I hesitated, uncertain as to whether I should chance knocking or not. Even as I meditated, the door began to open. I shrank back against the wall, flattening myself out as much as possible. The door swung wide, and a moor came through. Only a glimpse I had of the room beyond, out of the corner of my eye, but my unnaturally alert senses registered the fact that the room was empty. On the instant before he could turn, I smote the moor a single deathly blow behind the angle of the jawbone, and he toppled headlong down the stairs, to lie in a crumpled heap on the landing, his limbs tossed grotesquely about. My left hand caught the door as it started to slam shut, and in an instant I was through and standing in the room beyond. As I had thought, there was no occupant of this room. I crossed it swiftly and entered the next. These rooms were furnished in a manner before which the Soho house paled into insignificance. Barbaric, terrible, unholy, these words alone convey some slight idea of the ghastly sights which met my eyes. Skulls, bones, and complete skeletons formed much of the decorations, if such they were. Mummies leered from their cases, and mounted reptiles ranged the walls. Between these sinister relics hung African shields of hide and bamboo, crossed with assegais and war daggers. Here and there reared obscene idols, black and horrible. And in between, and scattered about among these evidences of savagery and barbarism, were vases, screens, rugs, and hangings of the highest oriental workmanship, a strange and incongruous effect. I had passed through two of these rooms without seeing a human being when I came to stairs leading upward. Up these I went, several flights, until I came to a door in a ceiling. I wondered if I was still under the earth. Surely the first stairs had let me into a house of some sort. I raised the door cautiously. Starlight met my eyes, and I drew myself warily up and out. There I halted. A broad flat roof stretched away on all sides, and beyond its rim on all sides glimmered the lights of London. Just what building I was on, I had no idea, but that it was a tall one I could tell, for it seemed to be above most of the lights I saw. Then I saw that I was not alone. Over against the shadows of the ledge that ran around the roof's edge, a great menacing form bulked in starlight. A pair of eyes glinted at me with a light not wholly sane. The starlight glanced silver from a curving length of steel. Ya Khan, the Afghan killer, fronted me in the silent shadows. A fierce, wild exultation surged over me. Now I could begin to pay the debt I owed Cthulhu's and all his hellish band. The dope fired my veins and sent waves of inhuman power and dark fury through me. A spring and I was on my feet, in a silent, deathly rush. Yakan was a giant, taller and bulkier than I. He held a tulwa, and from the instant I saw him, I knew that he was full of the dope to the use of which he was addicted. Heroin. As I came in, he swung his heavy weapon high in the air, but ere he could strike, I seized his sword wrist in an iron grip, and with my free hand drove smashing blows into his midriff. Of that hideous battle, fought in silence above the sleeping city, with only the stars to see, I remember little. I remember tumbling back and forth, locked in a death embrace. I remember the stiff beard rasping my flesh as his dope-fired eyes glazed wildly into mine. I remember the taste of hot blood in my mouth, the tang of fearful exultation in my soul, the onrushing and upsurging of inhuman strength and fury. God, what a sight for a human eye! 
Had anyone looked upon that grim roof where two human leopards, dope maniacs, tore each other to pieces? I remember his arm breaking like rotten wood in my grip and the tulwar falling from his useless hand. Handicapped by a broken arm, the end was inevitable, and with one wild uproaring flood of might, I rushed him to the edge of the roof and bent him backward, far out over the ledge. An instant we struggled there, then I tore loose his hold and hurled him over, and one single shriek came up as he hurtled into the darkness below. I stood upright, arms hurled up toward the stars, a terrible statue of primordial triumph, and down my breast trickled streams of blood from the long wounds left by the Afghan's frantic nails on neck and face. Then I turned with the craft of the maniac. Had no one heard the sound of that battle? My eyes were on the door through which I had come, but a noise made me turn, and for the first time I noticed a small affair, like a tower jutting up from the roof. There was no window there, but there was a door, and even as I looked, that door opened, and a huge black form framed itself in the light that streamed from within. Hasim. He stepped out on the roof and closed the door, his shoulders hunched and neck outthrust as he glanced this way and that. I struck him senseless to the roof with one hate-driven smash. I crouched over him, waiting some sign of his returning consciousness. Then away in the sky, close to the horizon, I saw a faint red tint, the rising of the moon. Where in God's name was Gordon? Even as I stood undecided, a strange noise reached me. It was curiously like the droning of many bees. Striding in the direction from which it seemed to come, I crossed the roof and leaned over the ledge. A sight nightmarish and incredible met my eyes. Some twenty feet below the level of the roof on which I stood, there was another roof of the same size and clearly a part of the same building. On one side it was bounded by the wall. On the other three sides, a parapet several feet high took the place of a ledge. A great throng of people stood, sat and squatted, close packed on the roof, and without exception they were Negroes. There were hundreds of them, and it was their low-voiced conversation which I had heard. But what held my gaze was that upon which their eyes were fixed. About the centre of the roof rose a sort of teokali. This, allowing for its infinitely smaller scale, was an exact type of those sacrificial pyramids. On the flat top of it was a curiously carved altar, and beside it stood a lank, dusky form, whom even the ghastly mask he wore could not disguise to my gaze. Santiago, the Haitian voodoo fetish man. On the altar lay John Gordon, stripped to the waist and bound hand and foot, but conscious. I reeled back from the roof edge, rent in twain by indecision. Even the stimulus of the elixir was not equal to this. Then a sound brought me about to see Hasim struggling dizzily to his knees. I reached him with two long strides and ruthlessly smashed him down again. Then I noticed a queer sort of contrivance dangling from his girdle. I bent and examined it. It was a mask similar to that worn by Santiago. Then my mind leapt, swift and sudden, to a wild, desperate plan, which to my dope-ridden brain seemed not at all wild or desperate. I stepped softly to the tower, and, opening the door, peered inward. I saw no one who might need to be silenced, but I saw a long silken robe hanging upon a peg in the wall, the luck of the dope fiend. I snatched it and closed the door again. Hasim showed no signs of consciousness, but I gave him another smash on the chin to make sure, and, seizing the mask, hurried to the ledge. A low guttural chant floated up to me, jangling, barbaric, with an undertone of maniacal bloodlust. The Negroes, men and women, were swaying back and forth to the wild rhythm of their death chant. 
On the Teocali, Santiago stood like a statue of black basalt, facing the east, dagger held high, a wild and terrible sight, naked as he was, save for a wide silken girdle and that inhuman mask on his face. The moon thrust a red rim above the eastern horizon, and a faint breeze stirred the great black plumes which nodded above the voodoo man's mask. The chant of the worshippers dropped to a low, sinister whisper. I hurriedly slipped on the death mask, gathered the robe close about me, and prepared for the descent. I was prepared to drop the full distance, being sure in the superb confidence of my insanity that I would land unhurt. But, as I climbed over the ledge, I found a steel ladder leading down. Evidently, Hasim, one of the voodoo priests, intended descending this way. So down I went, and in haste, for I knew that the instant the moon's lower rim cleared the city skyline, that motionless dagger would descend into Gordon's breast. Gathering the robe close about me, so as to conceal my white skin, I stepped down upon the roof and strode forward through the rows of black worshippers who shrank aside to let me through. To the foot of the Teokali I stalked, and up the stair that ran about it, until I stood beneath the death altar and marked the dark red stains upon it. Gordon lay on his back, his eyes open, his face drawn and haggard, but his gaze dauntless and unflinching. Santiago's eyes blazed at me through the slits of his mask, but I read no suspicion in his gaze until I reached forward and took the dagger from his hand. He was too much astonished to resist, and the black throng fell suddenly silent. That he saw my hand was not that of a negro, it is certain, but he was simply struck speechless with astonishment. Moving swiftly, I cut Gordon's bonds and hauled him erect. Then Santiago, with a shriek, leaped upon me, shrieked again, and, arms flung high, pitched headlong from the Teocali with his own dagger buried to the hilt in his breast. Then the black worshippers were on us with a screech and a roar, leaping on the steps of the Teocali like black leopards in the moonlight, knives flashing, eyes gleaming whitely. I tore mask and robe from me and answered Gordon's exclamation with a wild laugh. I had hoped that by virtue of my disguise I might get us both safely away, but now I was content to die there at his side. He tore a great metal ornament from the altar, and as the attackers came, he wielded this. A moment we held them at bay, and then they flowed over us like a black wave. To me, this was Valhalla. Knives stung me, and blackjacks smashed against me, but I laughed and drove my iron fists in straight, steam-hammered smashes that shattered flesh and bone. I saw Gordon's crude weapon rise and fall, and each time a man went down. Skulls shattered, and blood splashed, and the dark fury swept over me. Nightmare faces swirled about me, and I was on my knees, up again, and the faces crumpled before my blows. Through far mists, I seemed to hear a hideous familiar voice raised in imperious command. Gordon was swept away from me, but from the sounds I knew that the work of death still went on. The stars reeled through fogs of blood, but hell's exultation was on me, and I reveled in the dark tides of fury until a darker, deeper tide swept over me, and I knew no more. Chapter 20 Ancient Horror Here now, in his triumph, where all things falter, stretched out on the spoils that his own hand spread, as a god, self-slain on his own strange altar, death lies dead. Swinburne Slowly I drifted back into life, slowly, slowly. A mist held me, 
and in the mist I saw a skull. I lay in a steel cage like a captive wolf, and the bars were too strong, I saw, even for my strength. The cage seemed to be set in a sort of niche in the wall, and I was looking into a large room. This room was under the earth, for the floor was of stone flags, and the walls and ceiling were composed of gigantic block of the same material. Shelves ranged the walls, covered with weird appliances, apparently of a scientific nature, and more were on the great table that stood in the centre of the room. Beside this sat Cthulhu's. I staggered erect and gripped the bars, cursing. Gordon, curse you! Where is Gordon? Cthulhu's took a test tube from the table, eyed it closely, and emptied it into another. Ah, my friend awakes, he murmured in his voice, the voice of a living dead man. He thrust his hands into his long sleeves and turned fully to me. I think in you, he said distinctly. I have created a Frankenstein monster. I made of you a superhuman creature to serve my wishes, and you broke from me. You are the bane of my might, worse than Gordon even. You have killed valuable servants and interfered with my plans. However, your evil comes to an end tonight. Your friend Gordon broke away, but he is being hunted through the tunnels and cannot escape. You, he continued, with the sincere interest of the scientist, are a most interesting subject. Your brain must be formed differently from any other man that ever lived. I will make a close study of it and add it to my laboratory. How a man with the apparent need of the elixir in his system has managed to go on for two days, still stimulated by the last draft, is more than I can understand. My heart leapt. With all his wisdom, little Zuleika had tricked him, and he evidently did not know that she had filched a flask of the life-giving stuff from him. The last draft you had from me, he went on, was sufficient only for some eight hours. I repeat, it has me puzzled. Can you offer any suggestion? I snarled wordlessly. He sighed. As always, the barbarian. Truly, the proverb speaks. Jest with the wounded tiger and warm the adder in your bosom before you seek to lift the savage from his savagery. He meditated a while in silence. I watched him uneasily. There was about him a vague and curious difference. His long fingers emerged from the sleeves, drummed on the chair arms, and some hidden exultation strummed at the back of his voice, lended it unaccustomed vibrancy. And you might have been a king of the new regime, he said suddenly. I, the new, new, and inhumanly old. I shuddered as his dry, cackling laugh rasped out. He bent his head as if listening. From far off seemed to come a hum of guttural voices. His lips writhed in a smile. My black children, he murmured, they tear my enemy Gordon to pieces in the tunnels. They, Mr. Costigan, are my real henchmen, and it was for their edification tonight that I laid John Gordon on the sacrificial stone. I would have preferred to have made some experiments with him based on certain scientific theories, but my children must be humoured. Later, under my tutelage, they will outgrow their childish superstitions and throw aside their foolish customs. But now they must be led gently by the hand. How do you like these under-the-earth corridors, Mr. Costigan? He switched suddenly. You thought of them. What? No doubt that the white savages of your Middle Ages built them. For These tunnels are older than your world. They were built into being by mighty kings too many aeons ago for your mind to grasp. When an imperial city towered where this crude village of London stands, all trace of that metropolis 
has crumbled to dust and vanished. But these corridors were built by more than human skill. Ha ha! Of all the teeming thousands who move daily above them, none knows of their existence save my servants, and not all of them. Zuleika, for instance, does not know of them, for of late I have begun to doubt her loyalty, and shall doubtless soon make of her an example. At that, I hurled myself blindly against the side of the cage. A red wave of hate and fury tossed me in its grip. I seized the bars and strained until the veins stood out on my forehead and the muscles bulged and crackled in my arms and shoulders and the bars bent before my onslaught. A little but no more. And finally the power flowed from my limbs and I sank down trembling and weakened. Cthulhus watched me imperturbably. The bars hold, he announced with something almost like relief in his tone. Frankly, I prefer to be on the opposite side of them. You are a human ape, if ever there was one. He laughed suddenly and wildly. But why do you seek to oppose me? He shrieked unexpectedly. Why defy me, who am Cthulhus, the sorcerer, great even in the days of the old empire, today invincible, a magician, a scientist, among ignorant slaves, Ha! Ha! I shuddered, and sudden blinding light broke in on me. Cthulhus himself was an addict, and was fired by the stuff of his choice. What hellish concoction was strong enough, terrible enough, to thrill the master and inflame him, I do not know, nor do I wish to know. Of all the uncanny knowledge that was his, I, knowing the man as I did, Count this the most weird and grisly. You, you paltry fool, he was ranting, his face lit supernaturally. Know you who I am, Cthulhus of Egypt, bah, they knew me in the old days. I reigned in the dim misty sea lands, ages and ages before the sea rose and engulfed the land. I died, not as men die. The magic draught of life everlasting was ours. I drank deep and slept. Long I slept in my lacquered case. My flesh withered and grew hard. My blood dried in my veins. I became as one dead, but still within me burned the spirit of life. Sleeping, but anticipating the awakening, the great cities crumbled to dust. The sea drank the land. The tall shrines and lofty spires sank beneath the green waves. All this I knew as I slept, as a man knows in dreams. Cthulhus of Egypt, for Cthulhus of Atlantis! I uttered a sudden, involuntary cry. This was too grisly for sanity. I, the magician, the sorcerer, and down the long years of savagery, through which the barbaric races struggled to rise without their masters. The legend came of the day of empire, when one of the old race would rise up from the sea, I, and lead to victory the black people who were our slaves in the old days. These brown and yellow people, what care I for them? The blacks were the slaves of my race, and I am their god today. They will obey me. The yellow and the brown peoples are fools. I make them my tools, and the day will come when my black warriors will turn on them and slay at my word. And you, you white barbarians, whose ape ancestors forever defied my race and me, your doom is at hand. And when I mount my universal throne, the only whites shall be white slaves. The day came, as prophesied, when my case breaking free from the halls where it had lain since Atlantis was still sovereign of the world, where, since her empery, it had sunk into the green fathoms. When my case, I say, was smitten by the deep sea tides and moved and stirred and thrust aside the clinging seaweed that masks, temples and mirinets, and came floating up past the lofty sapphire and golden spires, 
up through the green waters to float upon the lazy waves of the sea. Then came a white fool carrying out the destiny of which he was not aware. The men on his ship, true believers, knew that the time had come, and I, the air entered my nostrils, and I awoke from the long, deep sleep. I stirred and moved and lived, and rising in the night, I slew the fool who had lifted me from the ocean, and my servants made obeisance to me and took me to Africa, where I abode a while and learned new languages and new ways of a new world and became strong. The wisdom of your dreary world. (laughs) I, who delved deeper into the mysteries of the old than any man dared go. All that men know today I know, and the knowledge beside that which I have brought down the centuries is as a grain of sand beside a mountain. You should know something of that knowledge. By it, I lifted you from one hell to plunge you into a greater. You fool, here, at my hand, is that which would lift you from this. I would strike from you the chains whereby I have bound you. He snatched up a golden vial and shook it before my gaze. I eyed it as men dying in the desert must eye the distant mirages. Cthulhu's fingered it meditatively. His unnatural excitement seemed to have passed suddenly, and when he spoke again, it was in the passionless, measured tones of the scientist. That would indeed be an experiment worthwhile to free you of the elixir habit and to see if your dope-riddled body would sustain life. Nine times out of ten, the victim, with the need and stimulus removed, would die, but you are such a giant of a brute. He sighed and set the vial down. The dreamer opposes the man of destiny. My time is not my own, or I should choose to spend my life pent in my laboratories, carrying out my experiments. But now, as in the days of the old empire, when kings sought my counsel, I must work and labor for the good of the race at large. I, I must toil and sow the seed of glory against the full coming of the imperial days when the seas give up all their living dead. I shuddered. Cthulhu's laughed wildly again. His fingers began to drum his chair arms and his face gleamed with the unnatural light once more. The red visions had begun to seethe in his skull again. Under the green seas they lie, the ancient masters, in their lacquered cases, dead as men reckon death, but only sleeping, sleeping through the long ages as hours, awaiting the day of awakening, the old masters, the wise men, who foresaw the day when the sea would gulp the land, and who made ready, made ready that they might rise again in the barbaric days to come, as I did. Sleeping they lie, ancient kings and grim wizards who died as men die before Atlantis sank, who, sleeping, sank with her, but who shall rise again? Mine, the glory! I rose first and sought out the site of old cities on shores that did not sink, vanished, long vanished. The barbarian tide swept over them thousands of years ago, as the green waters swept over their elder sister of the deeps. On some, the deserts stretched bare. Over some, as here, young barbarian cities rise. He halted suddenly. His eyes sought one of the dark openings that marked a corridor. I think his strange intuition warned him of some impeding danger, but I do not believe that he had any inkling of how dramatically our scene would be interrupted. As he looked, swift footsteps sounded, and a man appeared suddenly in the doorway, a man dishevelled, tattered and bloody, John Gordon. Cthulhu's sprang erect with a cry, and Gordon, gasping as from supernatural exertion, brought down the revolver he held in his hand, and fired point-blank, Cthulhu staggered, clapping his hand on his breast, and then, 
groping wildly, reeled to the wall and fell against it. A doorway opened, and he reeled through, but as Gordon leapt fiercely across the chamber, a blank stone surface met his gaze, which yielded not to his savage hammerings. He whirled and ran drunkenly to the table, where lay a bunch of keys the master had dropped there. The vial! I shrieked. Take the vial! And he thrust it into his pocket. Back along the corridor, through which he had come, sounded a faint clamour, growing swiftly, like a wolf pack in full cry. A few precious seconds, spent with fumbling for the right key. Then the cage door swung open, and I sprang out. A sight for the gods we were, the two of us, slashed, bruised and cut, our garments hanging in tatters. My wounds had ceased to bleed, but now, as I moved, they began again, and from the stiffness of my hands, I knew that my knuckles were shattered. As for Gordon, he was fairly drenched in blood, from crown to foot. We made off down a passage in the opposite direction from the menacing noise, which I knew to be the black servants of the master, in full pursuit of us. Neither of us was in good shape for running, but we did our best. Where we were going I had no idea. My superhuman strength had deserted me, and I was going now on willpower alone. We switched off into another corridor, and we had not gone twenty steps until, looking back, I saw the first of the black devils round the corner. A desperate effort increased our lead a trifle, but they had seen us, were in full view now, and a yell of fury broke from them to be succeeded by a more sinister silence as they bent all efforts to overhauling us. There, a short distance in front of us, we saw a stair loom suddenly in the gloom. If we might reach that, but we saw something else. Against the ceiling, between us and the stairs, hung a huge thing like an iron grill, with great spikes along the bottom, a portcullis, and even as we looked, without halting in our panting strides, it began to move. They're lowering the portcullis, Gordon croaked, his blood-streaked face a mask of exhaustion and will. Now the blacks were only ten feet behind us, now the huge grate gaining momentum with a creak of rusty, unusual mechanism, rushed downward. A final spurt, a gasping, straining nightmare of effort, and Gordon, sweeping us both along with a wild burst of pure nerve strength, hurled us under and through, and the grate crashed behind us. A moment we lay gasping, not heeding the frenzied horde, who raved and screamed on the other side of the grate. So close had that final leap been that the great spikes in their descent had torn shreds from our clothing. The blacks were thrusting at us with daggers through the bars, but we were out of reach, and it seemed to me that I was content to lie there and die of exhaustion. But Gordon weaved unsteadily erect and hauled me with him. Got to get out, he croaked. Go to warn Scotland Yard. Honeycombs! In heart of London, high explosive, arms, ammunition. We blundered up the steps, and in front of us I seemed to hear a sound of metal grating against metal. The stairs ended abruptly on a landing that terminated in a blank wall. Gordon hammered against this, and the inevitable secret doorway opened. Light streamed in, through the bars of a sort of grill. Men in the uniform of London police, were soaring at these with hacksaws, and even as they greeted us, an opening was made through which we crawled. You're hurt, sir! One of the men took Gordon's arm. My companion shook him off. There's no time to lose. Out of here, as quick as we can go. I saw that we were in a basement of some sort. We hastened up the steps and out into the early dawn, which was turning the east scarlet. Over the tops of small houses, I saw in the distance a great gaunt building on the roof of which I felt instinctively that wild drama had been enacted the night before. That building was leased some months ago by a mysterious Chinaman, 
said Gordon, following my gaze. Office building originally, the neighborhood deteriorated, and the building stood vacant for some time. The new tenant added several stories to it, but left it apparently empty. Had my eye on it for some time. This was told in Gordon's jerky swift manner as we started hurriedly along the sidewalk. I listened mechanically, like a man in a trance. My vitality was ebbing fast, and I knew that I was going to crumple at any moment. The people living in the vicinity had reported strange sights and noises. The man who owned the basement we just left heard queer sounds emanating from the walls of the basement and called the police. About that time I was racing back and forth among those cursed corridors like a hunted rat, and I heard the police banging on the wall. I found the secret door and opened it, but found it barred by a grating. It was while I was telling the astounded policeman to procure a hacksaw that the pursuing Negroes, whom I had eluded for the moment, came into sight, and I was forced to shut the door and run for it again. By pure luck, I found you, and by pure luck managed to find the way back to the door. Now, we must get to Scotland Yard. If we strike swiftly, we may capture the entire band of devils. Whether I killed Cthulhus or not, I do not know. Or if he can be killed by mortal weapons. But, to the best of my knowledge, all of them are now in those subterranean corridors, and... At that moment the world shook. A brain-shattering roar seemed to break the sky with its incredible detonation. Houses tottered and crashed to ruins. A mighty pillar of smoke and flame burst from the earth, and on its wings great masses of debris soared skyward. A black fog of smoke and dust and falling timbers enveloped the world. A prolonged thunder seemed to rumble up from the centre of the earth, as of walls and ceilings falling, and amid the uproar and the screaming, I sank down and knew no more. Chapter 21 The Breaking of the Chain And like a soul belated, in heaven and hell unmated, by cloud and mist abated, come out of darkness morn. Swinburne There is little need to linger on the scenes of horror of that terrible London morning. The world is familiar with, and knows most of the details, attending to the great explosion which wiped out a tenth of that great city with a resultant loss of lives and property. For such a happening, some reason must needs be given. The tale of the deserted building got out, and many wild stories were circulated. Finally, to still the rumours, the report was unofficially given out that this building had been the rendezvous and secret stronghold of a gang of international anarchists, who had stored its basement full of high explosives, and who had supposedly ignited these accidentally. In a way, there was a good deal to this tale, as you know, but the threat that had lurked there far transcended any anarchist. All this was told to me, for, when I sank unconscious, Gordon, attributing my condition to exhaustion and a need of hashish to the use of which he thought I was addicted, lifted me and with the aid of the stunned policeman got me to his rooms before returning to the scene of the explosion. At his rooms he found Hansen and Zuleika handcuffed to the bed as I had left her. He released her and left her to tend to me, for all London was in a terrible turmoil and he was needed elsewhere. When I came to myself at last, I looked up into her starry eyes and lay quiet, smiling up at her. She sank down upon my bosom, nestling my head in her arms and covering my face with her kisses. Stephen, she sobbed over and over as her tears splashed hot on my face. I was scarcely strong enough to put my arms about her, but I managed it, and we lay there for a space in silence, 
except for the girl's hard, racking sobs. Zuleika, I love you, I murmured. And I love you, Stephen, she sobbed. Oh, it is hard to part now, but I'm going with you, Stephen. I can't live without you. My dear child, said John Gordon, entering the room suddenly, Costigan's not going to die. We will have him enough hashish to tide him along, and when he is stronger, we will take him off the habit slowly. You don't understand, Sahib. It is not hashish Stephen must have. It is something which only the master knew, and now that he is dead or is fled, Stephen cannot get it and must die. Gordon shot a quick, uncertain glance at me. His fine face was drawn and haggard, his clothes sooty and torn from his work among the debris of the explosion. She's right, Gordon, I said languidly. I'm dying. Cthulhu's killed the hashish craving with a concoction he called an elixir. I've been keeping myself alive on some of the stuff that Zuleika stole from him and gave me, but I drank it all last night. I was aware of no craving of any kind, no physical or mental discomfort even. All my mechanism was slowing down fast. I had passed the stage where the need of the elixir would tear and rend me. I felt only a great lassitude and a deep desire to sleep, and I knew the moment I closed my eyes I would die. A strange dope, that elixir, I said with growing languor. It burns and freezes, and then at last the craving kills, easily and without torment. Costigan, curse it, said Gordon desperately. You can't go like this. That vial I took from the Egyptian's table, what is in it? The master swore it would free me of my curse and probably kill me also, I muttered. I had forgotten about it. Let me have it. It can no more than kill me, and I'm dying now. Yes, quick, let me have it, exclaimed Zuleika fiercely, springing to Gordon's side. Her hands passionately outstretched. She returned with the vial which he had taken from his pocket and knelt beside me, holding it to my lips, while she murmured to me gently and soothing in her own language. I drank, draining the vial, but feeling little interest in the whole matter, my outlook was purely impersonal, at such a low ebb was my life, and I cannot even remember how the stuff tasted. I only remember feeling a curious sluggish fire burn faintly along my veins, and the last thing I saw was Zuleika crouching over me, her great eyes fixed with a burning intensity on me. Her tense little hand rested inside her blouse, and remembering her vow to take her own life if I died, I tried to lift a hand and disarm her, tried to tell Gordon to take away the dagger she had hidden in her garments. But speech and action failed me, and I drifted away into a curious sea of unconsciousness. Of that period I remember nothing. No sensation fired my sleeping brain to an extent as to bridge the gulf over which I drifted. They say I lay like a dead man for hours, scarcely breathing, while Zuleika hovered over me, never leaving my side an instant and fighting like a tigress when anyone tried to coax her away to rest. Her chain was broken. As I had carried the vision of her into that dim land of nothingness, so her dear eyes were the first thing which greeted my returning consciousness. I was aware of a greater weakness than I thought possible for a man to feel, as if I had been an invalid for months, but the life in me, faint though it was, was sound and normal, caused by no artificial stimulation. I smiled up at my girl and murmured weakly, Throw away your dagger, little Zuleika. I'm going to live. She screamed and fell on her knees beside me, weeping and laughing at the same time. Women are strange beings of a mixed and powerful emotions, truly. Gordon entered and grasped the hand which I could not lift from the bed. You're a case for an extraordinary human physician now, Costigan, he said. 
Even a layman like myself can tell that. For the first time since I've known you, the look in your eyes is entirely sane. You look like a man who has had a complete nervous breakdown and needs about a year of rest and quiet. Great heavens, man, you've been through enough outside your dope experience to last you a lifetime. Tell me first, I said, was Cthulhas killed in the explosion? I don't know, answered Gordon somberly. Apparently, the entire system of subterranean passages was destroyed. I know my last bullet, the last bullet that was in the revolver which I wrested from one of my attackers, found its mark in the master's body. But whether he died from the wound, or whether a bullet can hurt him, I do not know. And whether in his death agonies, he ignited the tons and tons of high explosives which were stored in the corridors, or whether the Negroes did it unintentionally, we shall never know. My God, Costigan, did you ever see such a honeycomb? And we know not how many miles in either direction the passages reached. Even now Scotland Yard men are combing the subways and basements of the town for secret openings. All known openings, such as the one through which we came and the one in Soho 48, were blocked by falling walls. The office building was simply blown to atoms. What about the men who raided Soho 48? The door in the library had been closed. They found the Chinamen you killed, but searched the house without avail. Lucky for them, too, else they had doubtless been in the tunnels when the explosion came and perished with the hundreds of Negroes who must have died then. Every Negro in London must have been there. I dare say. Most of them are voodoo worshippers at heart, and the power the master wielded was incredible. They died. But what of him? Was he blown to atoms by the stuff which he had secretly stored, or crushed when the stone walls crumbled and the ceilings came thundering down? There is no way to search among those subterranean ruins, I suppose. None, whatever. When the walls caved in, the tons of earth upheld by the ceilings also came crashing down, filling the corridors with dirt and broken stone, blocking them forever and on the surface of the earth, the houses which the vibration shook down were heaped high in utter ruins. What happened in those terrible corridors must remain forever a mystery. My tale draws to a close. The months that followed passed uneventfully, except for the growing happiness which to me was paradise, but which would bore you were I to relate it. But one day, Gordon and I discussed the mysterious happenings that had had their being under the grim hand of the Master. Since that day, said Gordon, the world has been quiet, Africa has subsided, and the East seems to have returned to her ancient sleep. There can be but one answer, living or dead. Cthulhos was destroyed that morning when his world crashed about him. Gordon, I said, what is the answer to the greatest of all mysteries? My friend shrugged his shoulders. I have come to believe that mankind eternally hovers on the brinks of secret oceans of which it knows nothing. Races have lived and vanished before our race rose out of the slime of the primitive, and it is likely still others will live upon the earth after ours has vanished. Scientists have long upheld the theory that the Atlanteans possessed a higher civilization than our own, and on very different lines. Certainly, Cthulhus himself was proof that our boasted culture and knowledge were nothing beside that of whatever fearful civilization produced him. His dealings with you alone have puzzled all the scientific world, for none of them has been able to explain how he could remove the hashish craving stimulate you with a drug so infinitely more powerful, and then produce another drug which entirely effaced the effects of the other. I have him to thank for two things, I said slowly, the regaining of my last manhood, and Zuleika. Cthulhas, then, is dead, as far as any mortal thing can die. But what of those others, those ancient masters, 
who still sleep in the sea. Gordon shuddered. As I said, perhaps mankind loiters on the brink of unthinkable chasms of horror. But a fleet of gunboats is even now patrolling the ocean unobtrusively with orders to destroy instantly any strange case that may be found floating, to destroy it and its contents. And if my word has any weight with the English government and the nations of our world, the seas will be so patrolled until doomsday shall let down the curtain on the races of today. At night I dream of them sometimes, I muttered, sleeping in their lacquered cases, which drip with strange seaweed, far down among the green surges, where unholy spires and strange towers rise in the dark ocean. We have been face to face with an ancient horror, said Gordon somberly, with a fear too dark and mysterious for the brain to cope with. Fortune has been with us. She may not again favor the sons of men. It is best that we be ever on our guard. The universe was not made for humanity alone. Life takes strange phases, and it is the first instinct of nature for the different species to destroy each other. No doubt we seemed as horrible to the master as he did to us. We have scarcely tapped the chest of secrets which nature has stored, and I shudder to think of what that chest may hold for the human race. That's true, said I, inwardly rejoicing at the vigor which was beginning to course through my wasted veins. But men will meet obstacles as they come, as men have always risen to meet them. Now I am beginning to know the full worth of life and love, and not all the devils from the abysses can hold me. Gordon smiled. You have it coming to you, old comrade. The best thing is to forget all that dark interlude, for in that course lies light and happiness.